We've got balls. Growing up in San Antonio while attending Thomas Jefferson High School, Rote was an all-around star athlete, not only shining as a running back, but also as an outfielder, a point guard, and a sprinter. But in the midst of all of his success, tragedy stuck Rote in his youth, not only once, but twice. At the age of 16, he lost his mother in a car accident. Meanwhile, his brother was killed overseas while fighting in the Battle of Iwo Jima. After graduating high school, Rote headed 300 miles north and became a member of the SMU Mustangs football squad, joining fellow Texas native Doak Walker in the backfield. But Rote's first taste of national attention didn't come in the backfield. Instead, on New Year's Day of 1949, while taking on Oregon in the Cotton Bowl, with the Mustangs backed up against their own goal line midway through the second quarter, Rote booted what is to this day the longest punt in the history of the Cotton Bowl at a distance of 84 yards pinning Oregon at their own 12-yard line and allowing the Mustangs to maintain their narrow 7-point lead heading into halftime. On a side note before I go any further, it should be mentioned that the second longest punt in Cotton Bowl history took place only minutes before Rhodes kick when co-Cotton Bowl MVP Doak Walker punted the ball 79 yards down the field. When the third quarter rolled around, it was Rhodes who broke the game open with a 36-yard touchdown run to put SMU up 14. The game ended with a score of 21-13 to give the Mustangs their first bowl victory in program history. The following season, despite the return of both Rote and Walker, SMU came crashing back down to earth, and despite top 10 poll appearances as late as November 19th, it was losses in the final three games that left them on the outside looking in of the top 25 for the first time in three years. But in their final loss against top-ranked Notre Dame, Rote gave one of the greatest performances of his college career. Without star back Doak Walker, the Mustangs were facing an even steeper uphill climb against the Irish, who entered the game as an overwhelming 27-point favorite as they were riding a ridiculous 37-game win streak. However, despite the adversity, Rote put on a show for the ages, gaining 261 yards of total offense and scored each of the Mustangs three touchdowns to tie the game at 20 with only six minutes remaining. Unfortunately, the Irish were able to regain and hold on to the lead as they completed their fourth undefeated season in a row and captured their fourth national championship in eight years. But despite the loss, Rote and the Mustangs gave the champs their best contest of the season as the only team to finish within a single score of Notre Dame that year. As a senior, Rote led the Mustangs to a five-game win streak to begin the season and entered their Week 6 game against Texas as the top-ranked team in the nation. But despite their best efforts, including a pair of touchdowns from Rote, SMU suffered their first loss of the year with a score of 23-20. Unfortunately for the Mustangs, things began to snowball from there, and what once looked like a promising season quickly developed into a minor disaster as they dropped four of their last five games, finishing with a record of 6-4 as the 15th-ranked team in the nation. And despite the sharp decline of his team, Rote finished second in Heisman voting behind only Ohio State star and future seventh round pick Vic Janowitz. Just like the Eagles and the Bears before them, the Giants were the latest elite team to be given the coveted bonus pick that gave them the first overall pick despite coming off of a 10-2 season. However, if there's one flaw the Giants had, it was their middling offense that finished the 1950 season as the 11th in total yards gained and the 6th in scoring. In short, the addition of Rowe presented a potential shot of life to an offense of a team that had no problem winning games but struggled to score at times, which was evident in their 8-3 loss to the eventual champion Browns in the postseason. On top of this, Pro Bowl running back Gene Roberts had fled to Canada following the 1950 season, leaving a void at a position someone like Rowe could immediately fill. On January 18, 1951, in the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, the New York Giants selected Rowe with the first overall pick and he was the man they had hoped would be the final piece of their championship puzzle. Unfortunately, despite their 9-2-1 record, the Browns remained the class of the American division and left the Giants on the outside looking in on the championship game again. As for Rote, he only started five games in his rookie season and gained just 176 yards from scrimmage and scored a single touchdown. The following season, Rote's role in the offense was increased, however, and he had a career-high 124 touches, which was good enough for 661 yards from scrimmage and four touchdowns, and the Giants once again fell just short of the postseason, finishing second in the division once again to the Browns. Over the next few years, the once-mighty Giants began to sink into mediocrity and continued to carry one of the game's worst offenses, despite the emergence of both Rote and future Hall of Famer Frank Gifford. In the meantime, Rote had shifted to more of a receiving role in the Giants' offense after suffering a knee injury. And while he was a serviceable halfback, Rote proved to be a great receiver, leading the team in receiving yards in three straight seasons from 1953 to 1955, and made the Pro Bowl of four straight seasons from 1953 to 56. 
When the Giants finally emerged from their rebuild in 1956, they were a completely different team, adding Hall of Famers Andy Robustelli, Rosie Brown, and Sam Huff, and they also added a pair of legendary coaches to their staff in offensive coordinator Vince Lombardi and defensive coordinator Tom Landry. Also, it should be mentioned that this coincides with the end of Otto Graham's career and in turn the Browns' reign of terror. The Giants opened their season with seven straight wins and finished with a record of 8-3-1, giving them a first place finish in the Eastern Division and the right to take on the Chicago Bears in the championship game. As for Rote, in his final Pro Bowl season, he gained 405 yards receiving and averaged 14.5 yards per reception while scoring four touchdowns. On the final day of the 1956 season, the Giants met the Bears in front of a crowd of 57,000 at Yankee Stadium for the right to hoist the championship trophy. But what seemed like a potentially riveting matchup between the game's top offense and top defense quickly divulged into a one-sided affair in favor of the Giants that resulted in a 47-7 blowout, one of the most lopsided in championship history. Rhodes had just a single 9-yard reception on the day, but it did result in one of the Giants' many touchdowns and was the lone score he had in the four championships he appeared in throughout his career, including a 37-0 affair against the Packers in 1961, which proved to be his final game. At the time of his retirement, Rhodes was the Giants' all-time leader in receptions, receiving yards, and touchdown receptions. Following his playing career, Rhodes joined the Giants' staff as the team's offensive coordinator, a position he reveled in as he led the top unit in the league in each of his two seasons on the job. But following the team's third straight championship loss in 1963, Rhodes left the team for good, not intending to further his coaching career, and instead electing to become a broadcaster, working in both radio and TV throughout the 1960s and 70s. As for his personal life, Rhodes' eldest son Kyle Rhodes Jr. was one of the first major American soccer stars in the 1970s, becoming the only U.S.-born player to lead the NASL in scoring in league history. As far as his extended family goes, his cousin Tobin Rhodes had his own success on the gridiron, winning championships in both the AFL and NFL while taking home AFL MVP in 1963. Outside of his main occupation, Rhodes was something of a writer, publishing two books about football in the mid-1960s. He also published poetry, did oil paintings, and played piano, making him a bit of a renaissance man. Rowe passed away in 2002 at the age of 73 and has gone down as one of the great players of the Giants' golden age.